Next, we will welcome our finer speaker in the HGA session this morning, April Zambelli Wiener. Dr. Wiener is the founder and CEO of TTI Health Research and Economics, located in Westminster, Maryland. April is a seasoned executive and researcher with nearly two decades of experience working with manufacturers, payers, providers, and other healthcare leaders to improve patient access to hundreds of new, cost-effective medical technologies and programs, including precision medicine technologies through real-world evidence strategy, evidence generation, and synthesis, comparative effectiveness research, clinical economic studies, and modeling and value communication. Please welcome Dr. Wiener. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here with you today. So I'm gonna talk about PGX and HTA in the context of the new era of healthcare. How can we usher it in? What's holding us back? I'm gonna talk about some big picture ideas, challenge some of the status quo, and hopefully plant some seeds for constructive discourse. As a stylistic manner, I just wanna let you know that I like to include a lot of slides that you can refer back to later. So I have a good number of slides, but I won't get into the weeds on all of them, and I will be doing my absolute best to stick to my time limit. So let's jump in. This is Emmy. Emmy was born with a rare musculoskeletal birth defect. As many of you know, birth defects are adverse events that can come from early pregnancy drug exposure among other things. So Emmy was basically born without fingers and she has had 10 surgeries in her life. Often she had to be casted up to her armpits and this is how she had to feed herself. So why am I starting here with Emmy? Well, in addition to just keeping it real because healthcare is ultimately about people, not just numbers, it's because precision medicine and PGX specifically, it isn't about the averages or the masses and neither is preventing adverse events, which are often very rare. And the truth is we don't do that well with this in this country, the United States. Somehow we've adopted this attitude that rare is unimportant. In fact, I can't tell you how many times in my career I have heard the words, but it's rare, but it's only 1% of the population. It's a lot. Next slide. We also tend to think rare equals low burden or not costly. This is Kai, and he was born with a similar birth defect as Emmy. No right foot, only two fingers on his right hand, and at 11 years old, he's had to make the very difficult decision to amputate part of his leg for the hope of better mobility. This is the burden of this event in Kai's life even if the only cost you care about are dollars and cents. CDC estimates that the one-year hospitalization cost due to these kinds of birth defects is over a billion dollars. The burden of these events on these children, the families, and the healthcare system is tremendous. And I know this firsthand because, well, Emmy and Kai, they are my children. And we live with being the 1% that something happens to every day. And quite frankly, over the course of our journey, it often felt like no one cares. As a society, we get more excited about a prostate cancer drug that extends the life of a 65-year-old male for six months than preventing lifelong morbidity in these children. Think about it. So I wanted to do something about this. Next slide. And in 2019, I did with an amazing team of collaborators. We did a real world study, 1.5 million mother-child pairs in the United States over 15 years. We showed strong associations, we published, and you know what some reviewers said? The equivalent of, so what? It only affects a few people. But then something really good happened shortly after. The EU did a reassessment based on our study and others and changed their policy. It was fast and I applaud them for that. But honestly, the speed of translation felt like such an anomaly to me based on what traditionally happens. Next slide. So what's the point? Well, HTA, as we've been talking about, is a process of evidence synthesis by which we translate research to policy and practice. 
but synthesis does not mean marginalize. And somehow we've gotten a little lost. Finding and helping unique subsets has always been the charge. The unusual occurrence of disease and preventing it is literally the definition and foundation of epidemiology. So the message I wanna start out with is this, we've got to do better. We've got to care and focus on rare events and important subgroups who make up the masses. Not focusing on this is, in my opinion, one cause of the predicament we find ourselves here in this country with low value healthcare. So on the right is precision medicine. On the left is a map of childhood cancer in the US. Green is the highest, Texas, Illinois. If we treat Texas and Illinois like the whole country, we're likely going to swing and miss. And it's the same thing here. Next slide. So landscape. One idea that I'd like us to consider is this. In the US, our approach to HTA is one cause of our low value healthcare, where large investments are not translating to improved outcomes and reduced costs of care in the way that they should. So let's do a quick landscape. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the path to getting impactful technologies to the patients who need them is already complex. We've got a lot of stakeholders and a lot of gatekeepers. Evidence drives this process from development to regulatory approval to market access, but not the same evidence. HTA underlies the decisions that are made by payers and clinical societies who are often the final gatekeepers as to whether a technology gets to providers and patients. Next slide. So one big problem is that evidence types and standards don't align. This represents, this slide represents the experience of many of our med tech clients. They break through the wall of regulatory approval thinking they've made it only to come smack into the wall or in this case, perhaps fall off the cliff of the US payer system because in fact, levels of evidence for coverage and adoption are much more rigorous than those for regulatory approval. Next slide. So HTA is one of our key translational tools, but it's creating a bottleneck. Decades of research have identified many gene drug pairs. A small portion of those have been approved by FDA for therapeutic management. And according to a recent study, only a very small number of patients have access. So despite all of the investments we're making, the research is not translating. So we have to ask why. I have some ideas, Other ha others have great ideas. You've already heard some of those. You're gonna hear a lot more today. But what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of my time is our framework for HTA and the level and type of evidence that's required. Next slide. So how do we evaluate or assess who gets through? Next slide. We say we want value. We all talk a lot about value, but what does that mean? Just like you and I may value different things to be maximally effective, maybe you value a good night's sleep and I value good coffee in the morning, but our ecosystem and stakeholders in our ecosystem, they value different things. And even within the same stakeholder groups, we don't agree. For example, the same exact evidence can be assessed and valued completely differently by different payers. Next slide. So we, we say we want value. What we really talk about is clinical utility. So when we talk about precision medicine technologies, diagnostics, and PGX specifically, payers will often cite a lack of clinical utility as a reason for denying coverage. Next slide. So what is clinical utility? Well, at its core, utility means useful, beneficial, right? But useful how, when, to whom? Next slide. The truth is experts disagree. Some take a very broad view of clinical utility, like ACMG, who includes patient and societal perspectives in their definition. But others take a very narrow and specific view of clinical utility, like BCBS Tech, 
They're highly focused on net health outcome, meaning significant morbidity and mortality events. So for PGX, a big part of the churn is around the issue of clinical utility. Next slide. So clearly we have some definitional issues which can cause confusion, but what actually happens or is happening out there in the market right now? Well, payers are undertaking an assessment process that as you've already heard, one, can vary significantly, but two, rely on standards that demand a high level and a high volume of very specific types of evidence. So focus on net health outcomes, preference to prospective randomized controlled studies, no heterogeneity, which means consistency across that evidence. So why is this a problem? Next slide. So what if we're focusing on the wrong questions? and measuring the wrong things, and therefore relying on the wrong tools? What if, like the cavemen, we're too busy, caught up in the churn of the system we've created, that we're not evolving our approaches, including HTA, to really address the evolution and complexity of our systems and our technologies? Next slide. So I like to use simple examples to think through and illustrate complex concepts. I tested this on my kids. Hopefully it will hang together. If it doesn't for you, not to worry. I have a real world example coming next, but let's put the wheel example to work. So we have the goal of getting two rocks to the end and we have two wheelbarrows, one with a wheel, one without. Without the wheel, we can only take one rock at a time because it's hard and the terrain is rough and we have to go slower, it's unstable, the rock might fall out. So it takes us longer, 15 minutes over two trips to get two rocks to the end. But ultimately we do it with the wheel, smooth sailing, we do it faster. But if we look after 30 minutes, both wheelbarrows have accomplished the goal, two rocks at the end. In some ways, this represents our current paradigm in many situations with HTA, where we are so focused on the end, the net health outcome, that we only care about or care most about the final destination. But here's the rub, right? Sometimes there's no difference because ultimately everyone catches up. Next slide. So now let's look at this just a little bit differently. Let's call this a smart paradigm. What if we stop and look at what happened after eight minutes? No one has gotten to the goal yet. So without the wheel, because we're unstable, we have an event, we drop a rock. With the wheel, we're on our way. We have healthier rocks, more rocks closer to the outcome. We have less wear and tear on the resources. We don't know if the wheel will change the outcome, but do we need to, to evaluate if the wheel is useful? Because even if the ultimate outcome is the same, why wouldn't we use the wheel? It gets to the issue of efficiency that my, my colleague, Dr. Brian, really just spoke about. And I would offer that part of the problem is the narrow view of clinical utility that is too often embraced. Next slide. So you might be thinking, this is an oversimplification. And of course it is to illustrate a point, but perhaps we're being too rigid and we're missing opportunities to make an important impact on our healthcare system, both outcomes and costs. So now let's take this out of cartoon world and into the real world. And I'd like to run through a quick real world example of how this plays out. Next slide. Let's talk about warfarin. So warfarin is a commonly prescribed anticoagulant. It's also a significant cause of adverse drug events. Um, most people are familiar with warfarin or Coumadin. Being out of range is how we measure efficacy or effectiveness, and that can be a cause of ADEs. So we, we understand at some level that genetics play a role in explaining the variability in this individual INR response. Next, next slide. In fact, we've identified two genetic targets that modify responsiveness to warfarin. CYP2C9 and vcor c one So I just mentioned variability in INR, but what I really wanna emphasize is that warfarin therapy is really difficult to manage. 
and I think a lot of people know this, but studies have shown that stable patients on long-term therapy are in range only about 55% of the time. So even over time, in stable long-term users, it's not that much better than flipping a coin. So optimization of oral anticoagulant therapy is it's a high unmet clinical need. And accordingly, we've invested a lot of time and resources into this, and we have a large evidence base. So let's get into that a little bit. Next slide. I am not gonna bore you by walking through all of this, but I just wanted to give it to you as a reference point. Bottom line, we already have a lot of evidence over decades about the genetics of warfarin sensitivity and the impact of PGX guided dosing on outcomes and cost. Next slide. In 2010, FDA added PGX guided dosing to the warfarin label. Also, we have literally hundreds of studies that have already been meta-analyzed, validity, utility, cost-effectiveness. It certainly begs the question for me, what are we doing? Where do we go from here? Next slide. So before we try to answer that or toss around some ideas, I wanna call out one specific study that really, in my opinion, aligns with the SMART paradigm that I put forward earlier. This was a Mayo study done in 2009, very robust, real world, non-interference study, meaning they did genotyping, they provided physicians with a report, and then they observed what happened over the next six months. Based on our current paradigm, this might be a no-no study, right? It's not an RCT, it doesn't focus on net health outcome, it's short term, but what they found was pretty compelling. They found a 28% decrease in hospitalizations and 43% decrease in hospitalizations specifically related to embolic events. So those were their main endpoints. Next slide. But what they did was go back and explore the data to triangulate on a conclusion. They found that physicians were in fact making dosing changes based on genotype reports, supporting the utility of the testing. Next slide. That said, as of a 2019 study that examined 223 medical policies, there was no coverage among the top private payers. Next slide. CMS has a national coverage determination, coverage with evidence development. This means they'll pay for the testing only if it's used in an approved study. Also for new users only, so that means that all those current users still having trouble staying in INR, they aren't getting access. They're not being addressed. The study has to be prospective and focused on those net health outcomes. I can tell you as an epidemiologist and statistician that they're going to need to follow a lot of people for a good while based on the rates of these outcomes. Next slide. So returning to our prior example, the net health outcomes that CMS wants to see, embolic events, death, those are the rocks. Worst case scenario, maybe they're the same, like the current paradigm with the rocks after 30 minutes. But we've already got all of this evidence that shows all of these really good things. We can get patients to therapeutic range faster. We can reduce AEs. We're missing out on making all of these improvements that drive at the quadruple aim. This to me is clinically useful. So what are we waiting for? Next slide. So I've raised a lot of questions, concerns, challenges. Let's toss around some ideas, some food for thought. What can we do right now? First and foremost, we need to do what we're doing right here today. We need to engage and collaborate. So I really wanna thank Ben and Sarah and the team at Park for bringing us together. You've already heard about some great ideas, things happening from my colleagues, and you'll hear more today. I've laid out a few other things that I'd just like to touch on briefly. Next slide. Smart evidence generation and thinking about HTA differently and the type of evidence that can really inform policy and practice. 
The bottom line is we have to not just accept, but fully understand and embrace that the RCT is not the best study design for addressing many important questions in healthcare. With smart evidence, we can focus on short-term, meaningful, attainable, real-world, and triangulated evidence and data. Next slide. So mapping this back to the Mayo study as an example, we can see it was a short-term study. There were meaningful outcomes. It was attainable, a simplified non-interference approach while ensuring internal validity, real world. So it's real world data, all comers. And they triangulated, measuring other outcomes that could point to a causal conclusion. Next slide. Incentivize. There are things we can do to better incentivize stakeholders in our ecosystem to take action and demonstrate impact. And I know you're gonna hear about some of these later today, so I'm excited for that. We don't need to have absolute certainty from the beginning. There are points of disconnection in our process. If we deliver value by better HTA underlying our decisions, are we rewarded for it? Are we even going back and evaluating if decisions based on HTA have high return on investment? Next slide. Prioritize. We have groups that need our attention and support, underserved groups, issues of health equity, which I am also very passionate about and didn't have the time to get into today. We don't have to open a floodgate. We have to prioritize. Next slide. Keeping it real. So in my opinion, we must evolve our ecosystem and HTA to be a real system, yes, based in real world data and scenarios, but also rapid evaluation, action and learning. This is not a new concept. It borrows from more traditional program evaluation in public health. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Christensen, who, who presented earlier, really astutely stated in one of his recent ISPOR papers that HTA should be rooted in evaluation. And I absolutely agree. Next slide. So right now we have a very top-down model. There is a long translational distance from research to bedside or to the patient. There can be a huge chasm between research and the real world. In a rapidly learning model of healthcare, we can shorten that distance. We can also ensure that our research and our models more closely approximate the real world. Next slide. So at the end, the challenge is really to all of us. Can we usher in a new era of healthcare? I believe we can, but like my colleagues at McKinsey, I believe it will require us to embrace new paradigms and new ways of thinking. Next slide. This is me. This is where you can find me. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity to share some of my passion and experience and ideas with you today. And please don't hesitate to reach out anytime. Great. Thank you.